All right, so we're going to talk about lower urinary tract symptoms, BPH versus OAB, flow versus volume. And the reason I want to bring this up, is this mic? There we go. You know, when you go to a primary care doc, when a patient goes to the primary care doc, um, what happens, unfortunately, is they come in with lower urinary tract symptoms, whatever it is, urgency, frequency, nocturia. And if it's a woman, they get diagnosed with OAB. If it's a male, they're diagnosed with BPH because that's just how we've been trained to do this. And the reality is there's a simpler way to do that, a simpler way to elicit this. And one of the things that I try to do, and, and I'm gonna keep pointing at you since you and I are doing the same thing here, you know, very frequently, um, you know, people can have a mix of those or maybe none of these. You know, maybe when you come in with lower urinary tract symptoms, it's a medical problem. So just because y'all are urologists and the world that you see is between the belly button and the kneecaps, it doesn't actually mean that the LUTs symptoms are just that, from the prostate if you have one, or the bladder. And there's a medical cause of, of lower urinary tract symptoms very often. So one of the things that I do suggest to my urologic colleagues is when we talk about shared care, and Dave was talking about in cancer work, shared care is also with lower urinary tract symptoms. You know, maybe you do have OAB. Maybe you are going to the bathroom quite a bit and having urgency because of low bladder volumes, but the fact is it's not bothersome until you had a heart attack and you're on hydrochlorothiazide and you're pushing all that fluid through. So there's, you know, that the interaction between uh, family docs, internal medicine, and urologists are certainly very important. All right, so let's just kind of go back to uh, 101, um, let's, here's OAB. You know, if we're going to be talking about OEB, we need to define it. It's a syndrome or symptom complex defined as urgency with or without urgent continence, usually frequency and nocturia. Um, nocturia. Urgency is the big symptoms. This is what drives people into the office. You know, I had a guy the other day came in, and why are you here? What's changed over time? It's like I can't be rushing to the bathroom anymore. It's becoming embarrassing at work. And urgency is that symptom that I, I, I hear frequently. It's common. You know, this is important for us to realize both in urology and primary care, this is very common and a lot of people are undiagnosed. I was in the clinic yesterday till five, I saw all of these diseases and I guarantee you there were quite a few with OAB and, and with OAB that I may not have known about because they might have been hiding it. We think about OAB being a female disease, it's actually both a male and a female disease. It's more prevalent in women as they're younger, as, they get, as we get older, it's men and women. Why is a slide like this important? It's because if that 70-year-old male comes into your office and we fail treatment for BPH, we have to scratch our heads and say some, maybe something else is going on, and it could very well uh, be is OAB. What about the prostate? You know, we just heard a wonderful talk on the prostate just to uh, kind of review a few things. It gets bigger as we get older, all right? Doesn't mean it becomes symptomatic. Only about 10% of patients will become symptomatic. It has two options. It's either going to grow out or grow in. If it grows in, it causes blockage. If it causes blockage, you have poor flow, and that's where you get symptomatic. There's a wonderful slide from Klaus Roborn I've used for many years now, and I think it's, it's extremely important to teach this. If your PSA is elevated, which is a surrogate marker for prostate size, we'll talk about that later, if your prostate is about 30 grams at 55 years of age, you can expect it to be about 61 grams by the time you're 70. Why is that important? If you're symptomatic at 55, you're going to be more symptomatic at 70. You may not need treatment, but we should tell the patient ahead of time, this is what we can expect, be aware of it, and if there's a problem, let me know. This comes from, uh, oh, Dave, it's one of your papers. Look at that. I quote this all the time. This is actually a very important paper, so I do have to give him credit for this. This is the risk evaluation for BPH. If you have these five risk factors, it's predict predicted that your prostate will become more symptomatic. A total prostate volume of 31, a PSA of greater than or equal to 1.6, age of 62. That a primary care doctor can readily do. We don't generally do flow, although Michigan, we have snow. And I tell people, if you can write your name in the snow in script as opposed to Braille, you're probably pretty good. So number four, Dave, since you wrote this paper, can we say Braille signature in the snow? Very good. And a post-void residual of greater than 39, that's a risk factor as well. And as we're dealing with LUTs symptoms, we should acknowledge the fact that these things can coexist. And sorry, the OAB part of that didn't come out very well. But the reality is this, is you can have a big prostate. As Ryan said, it doesn't have to be obstructed. If it does, you can have symptoms of LUTs. If you have OAB, you could have symptoms of LUTs, and you can certainly have them together. 
Now, the question I'm asked frequently is, well, if OAB is so common, why don't we see it? Why, why, why is it not out there? Well, that's because people cope. Last night I got on a plane, I flew from Phoenix to, uh, I'm sorry, Detroit to, to here, and the reality is there were a lot of people on that flight who didn't, who stopped drinking fluids a couple hours before, who went to the bathroom as soon as they said we're going to do pre-check, we're going to get people in because, you know, with their dog, their multiple handicapped dogs or whatever they're coming on with these days, they ran to the bathroom to empty their bladder again. They had, they had diapers in their bag, they had pads, they had dark clothing. All right, I guarantee you that they did that because people cope. They know where all the bathrooms are. They bathroom map. All right, they were, as I said, they restrict their fluid. They try to get on a schedule. And unfortunately, they, when it becomes a problem for them when they come into the office, it's because they can't cope anymore. I, I just had a patient about two weeks ago who I kind of knew was having a problem, but she was coping with it. And they moved into a new factory. She works at a tool and die in Jackson. And she went from a position that was near the toilet to a position that was away from the toilet, about 100 yards. These are big factories. So now she has to walk around everybody to get to the bathroom, whereas before she was able to hide it. So these coping mechanisms no longer work for her. So if we're going to understand LUTs, and this is something to talk to your primary care about, because remember, the primary care doctor in family practice has had maybe two weeks, probably no training in urologic care. The internal medicine doc had no training in urologic care, yet as you know, Dave had, had mentioned, 30%, you know, 30 percent of what I do in the day has to deal with that area between the belly button and the kneecaps. So if we're going to deal with LUTs, we have to understand normal function of the bladder, normal function of the prostate. What does the bladder do? It holds urine. Alan Ween said this years ago, and it was brilliant. It holds urine and it empties urine. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't walk, it doesn't talk, it doesn't absorb. It does it comfortably. I should be able to hold three to 500 mLs. I should be able to empty three to 500 mLs. I should be able to go to the bathroom comfortably and not feel like I have to hold my crotch as I'm running across the room. All right, that's what it should do. Abnormal function is when it doesn't do that. I'm holding less than the three to 500. I have this uncontrollable urge. So the bladder is all about volume. Everything we talk about with the bladder is about volume. In regards to the prostate, Ryan just went through this, two functions for the prostate. One, fluid for seminal emission. So I will add a function for you, Ryan. I think you only gave that one. The second function is to stay the hell out of the way. Does a really bad job at that and it becomes obstructed. The symptoms, very easy. You know, the bladder is about volume, so you're going to have urgency, frequency, nocturia of small volumes. Remember that, of small volumes. Voiding, prostate, poor flow, hesitancy getting that flow out, problem getting the flow out, straining to get the flow out. Pro bladder is storage and volume, voiding flow is the prostate. And we wrote this up a couple years ago, and I think it holds true now. If we differentiate this thing, this is what I tell my colleagues as I'm teaching them in primary care. Look, you don't have to spend a lot of time on this. It's a weak flow, you gotta focus on the prostate. If it's, you're avoiding small amounts, think the bladder. If you're leaking urine, think the bladder or the sphincter. And if you have good flow and normal volume, this is where the, do the medical doc comes in, the family practice, the internal medicine doc. If you have good flow and good volume, what are you thinking? It's a medical issue. We've got to refocus. That is not a urologic issue now. That you have good volume, the bladder's doing what it's supposed to do, you have good flow, the prostate's staying out of the way, it is a medical problem and you need to treat that accordingly. So in 2007, a group of us got together, we wrote up an algorithm for primary care, very simply called it the LUTZ algorithm. Now, I'll, I'll walk you through this. The idea is looking at LUTZ, it's like looking at an onion. You know, we're peeling away the onion. Maybe this is causing it, maybe that's causing it. What is the core of this that's giving us the problem of urgency, frequency, nocturia, whatever symptoms you have. So we start with symptoms. We start with, are you having frequency, nocturia, urgency of small volumes? This comes from the, the, um, your, uh, the, the uh, Uranamic Society. This comes from their guidelines and the ICS, frequency, nocturia, urgency. I don't really buy this very well, though. I don't look at frequency as less than eight times a day. I look at frequency of small volumes. Because if you're voiding 500 mLs every hour, 
That is not OAB or BPH. That is actually a medical issue. Nocturia and urgency, again, the same thing. What are the volumes? These are some questions that you can ask. I've written this up several times. I, I suggest these only as ideas for the patient or for the doctor to talk about. You know, everyone's going to come up with their own questions, and you've got to talk to the patient on a terminology that they'll understand. Do you have a sudden urge to void? Do you wear a pad or a diaper? Do you sit through a movie? And, and I know these sound like very basic questions, but it's amazing. Um, I, I had a patient years ago who um, had told me that uh, everything was fine. She was in her physical uh, earlier in the year, and she comes in three months later. And she said, I'm having a problem. I said, well, what's your problem? She goes, well, I, I'm rushing to the bathroom. I'm wetting myself. I said, when did it become a problem? She goes, when I start my, uh, started overflowing my diaper. I'm like, I didn't know you wore a diaper. She goes, you never asked me. So her idea of normal was a diaper. So we really have to have some good quality questions here. This is the IPSS. I think everybody here is familiar with it. I guarantee you most primary care don't use it. I guarantee you they'll, they'll understand the questions. And as you talk to your colleagues who refer to you, let them know that there are some questions that they can use, such as the IPSS, to help delineate uh, prostatic uh, symptoms. Now, what about the history, physical, and labs? I mean, as we're doing this, what can we do in a primary care setting? There, there's certainly the medical and the surgical history. There's medications, focused physical exam. These are all things that will help us. The key point with this slide, as I'm going to go through the, the points in just a minute, but urodynamic cystoscopy and diagnostic renal and bladder ultrasound are not necessary. This was made clear by the AUA a couple years ago, although it took them until 2012 before they finally admitted you didn't need a comprehensive workup in the uncomfortable complicated patient, which means that in a primary care setting, we can evaluate that patient with LUTs very simply, and like what I like to say is in two minutes or less with duct tape and popsicle sticks, and be able to make an appropriate evaluation. Now, when does the medical problem become involved? I mean, this is stuff I do. This is not stuff necessarily the urologist does, but diabetes, you'll have the either polyuria, polydipsia. You know, if you had a recent heart attack, you're going, to, you're going to have a low EF afterwards. You're going to develop some congestive failure. You're going to have pitting edema in the lower extremities, which means when you go to bed at night and you lift your legs, it all rushes up and it flows out, so you're peeing at night. That's not, that's not your bladder. That's not your prostate, although you may have had a little bit of a problem before, but it's been exacerbated by the fact of fluid mobilization. So these are things I need to know. Surgery. You know, very common. I mean, I see this constantly in orthopedic surgery because you go in, you get your hip done, right? Orthopedist sends you home, right? You're immobile. You're sitting there holding your hip, watching TV, and get that first urge to void. You don't want to get up because you, it hurts. You get the second urge to void. You still don't want to get up. And you finally get up after the third urge, which, as you know, there is no third urge. You've wet yourself because you can't get to the bathroom. Or the orthopedist gives you 100 Norco and you want to be a good patient and take your 100 Norco, which you shouldn't be doing, and then you haven't had a bowel movement in a week, right? And you call up the uh, orthopedist and say, I haven't had a bowel movement. He says, tough luck, go uh, call your primary care doc, and we disimpact them, which we've done and we hate. <laughs> so, you know, and, you know, these are things, it's, it's, there's a temporal relationship to the symptoms and what's going on and the onset of, of what we would consider lower urinary tract symptoms. You know, medications, it can be anything on any list. Um, I look at the temporal relationship. I mean, in, in this time of year, cold and flu season, allergies in Michigan, you'll probably be seeing that down here in Arizona soon. You take the second generation antihistamine with a D on it, if a male and the D on it, you can't pee, your stream is low, you go to the doctor not realizing it's your cold medicine. So I look at that temporal relationship as well. Physical exam, very simple. You know, the nice thing in primary care is this is what we do all the time. We don't need to repeat things that have been done, but we want to look at the abdomen for tenderness, masses, distension, make sure the bladder is not up to the xiphoid. Make sure they know to get to the bathroom. Make sure they can walk to the bathroom. You know, I've had three patients with MS I've diagnosed who came in with lower urinary tract symptoms. Two had cerebellar ataxia. One had fecal incontinence. All right? 
So neurologically, there was a problem going on. So we can assess that. You don't need to do, you know, the type of neurologic exam a neurologist is going to do, but you want to do something and make sure that they're okay. The general urinary exam, unfortunately, with all the guideline changes, uh, primary care think you don't have to ever pull somebody's pants down. I am against that. We should be pulling their pants down. That's why you come to a doctor's office. You want to feel like you really got tortured well. All right, make sure the opening is open, make sure the meatus is open. We don't, we are not doing that. Please help your colleagues understand that. Look at the meatus, make sure the foreskin retracts, make sure in a female you look at the meatus. I've seen a woman who came in from a gynecologist actually. She had lower urinary tract symptoms. I, in the evaluation, I told her I needed to do a vaginal exam. She said, I just had one with my gynecologist. I said, your gynecologist made a mistake. She goes, what mistake did he make? I said he didn't use my hands. And uh, I mean, that's the, the good part about it. The bad part is I found a urethral tumor. All right? So those things do happen. And the rectal exam, please do those. Please, please, please do those. And make sure your colleagues do those. You know, I don't need to tell you guys why to do it. Our primary care colleagues don't seem to like it. The AUA put out the guidelines for lab tests a couple years ago. I disagreed with them because they only look at the urinalysis. You cannot screen for diabetes with the UA. I published in the white journal that they still ignore me. The bottom line is you have to have a blood sugar of 180 before you're spilling into the urine, so be very careful with that. Use a fasting or random blood sugar. PSA, we're going to talk about uh, quite a bit. I'll talk about in my next talk. This is not screening anymore, so this whole screening argument goes away. This is a patient coming in with LUTs, so check a PSA. If the PSA is 1.5 or more, it equates to a prostate gram size of 30, and that's the person at risk. Voiding diaries. I love these. You have everyone do these. Go home, pee in a hat, you know, your little bladder hat, and collect how much. See what the volumes are. Is it 50? Is it 100? Is it 200? You should be 300. And it should be 24 hours, seven days a week. It shouldn't just be when you get a triple latte on your way home from work. All right? If you have OAB, it's going to happen all the time. And if you want to manage how your OAB treatment's going, then uh, voiding diary certainly helps us as well. Post-void residuals, there's this urban myth that we're going to put people into retention. That is not true. That is not true. It's been debunked. So a lot of guys in years past were not getting treatment for OAB. They were only getting treatment for BPH. That is false. Um, if you have a good flow, the chances of you going into retention is very, very low. If there's any concern, check a post-void residual. I did a meta-analysis a couple years ago, which I published, and if your post-void residual is less than 50, the chances of you having a problem is very, very low. And primary care don't have a post-void residual, but they can get a residual at a local diagnostic ultrasound area. The most important slide I can show you to share with your primary care colleagues is how to stay out of trouble. Simple evaluation tools, effective treatment, and safety. Show them when to refer to you. That's the list here. You guys can read that. But it's very, very important. Make sure to share that with them. And the reality is now, once we've done this evaluation, the treatment can be impaired. There's no identifiable etiology, no reversible causes. We ask the patient, with your LUTs that you're presented with, are you bothered enough that you want treatment? No? Okay, fine. I'll see you in a little bit. Keep, let's keep in touch on this. Or if it is, if it's flow, think prostate, voiding volumes, think the bladder and incontinence, think the bladder or the outlet. And I'll go back to the algorithm just for this. Frequently, my colleagues will be wondering, how do I know it's not the prostate? Well, you don't. You don't necessarily always know. If they have a good flow, it's unlikely. So if you worry about it, treat the prostate first and then think about the uh, bladder afterward. And I'm going to end with this before I go to Ryan. What are the treatment guidelines? I know Ryan's going to go more into this before. Behavioral treatment, bladder hygiene, teach people how to avoid, teach them to take their time, rest the pelvic musculature, count to 10 and pee again. Very, very important. important. Sit on the toilet if you, if you need to. All right, males get uptight about that, sit on the toilet, that'll help. Females, you'd be amazed, women do not sit on toilets that they did not buy. They feel like they're gonna get an STD or get pregnant. Um, we, we, that is false. <laughs> that is absolutely false. So, you know, the bottom line is tell them, it's okay, sit on the toilet and relax. Don't keep your legs together and, and, and stress all the pelvic musculature like this. You need to relax and, and um, do it in the privacy of your own home, do it in the privacy of a stall, but relax the pelvic musculature. If we go to uh, pharmacologic management, if it's OAB, we have antimuscarinics and beta-3s. You can use them in monotherapy or combination, BPH, alpha blockers, PD-5s, 5-ARIs. I've used all of them in combination before. 
And, um, and if it's OAB and BPH, I will use a combination of meds and I will tell my colleagues that. And I'll try them to exhaust several efforts before they finally refer off to the specialist. And my final slide, you know, we ignore BPH and OAB. We have to be aware of that. And it, it steals, it doesn't take your life, it steals your life. But on the other hand, if you do have OAB and you do have BPH and you're going to the bathroom a lot, unfortunately that's when if you're old you tend to fall down. If you fall down you break something, if you break something you die. The mortality of a hip fracture in an elderly male is 70%, it's 50% in a female. And these patients are in the primary care office. Unfortunately, we don't ask as well as we should, but they can very simply be identified and treated.